Today we're diving into the topic of portfolio rebalancing, what it is, why it matters, when to do it, and how to go about it. Beyond the basics, we'll cover three pros and cons of rebalancing, and look at three rebalancing scenarios using Google Sheets to illustrate the mechanics of rebalancing. The links to the Google Sheets document and all articles discussed are in the description. If you find topics like this helpful, take a moment to subscribe for future content. Your support is very much appreciated. So, what is portfolio rebalancing? It is the process of selling assets that have outperformed and buying assets that have underperformed, with the goal of realigning your portfolio to its target asset allocation. This may seem counterintuitive, as you're selling your best performing investments and buying more of the underperformers. Over time, some investments will grow faster than others, causing your portfolio to drift from its target allocation. Rebalancing realigns your portfolio with your investment objectives and risk tolerance. Before we go further, let's clear up a common misconception about portfolio rebalancing. It is not about maximizing absolute returns. Instead, it's about staying disciplined and keeping your portfolio aligned with your long-term goals. To understand rebalancing, let's start with the basics of building a portfolio. A well-diversified portfolio is key to managing risk. This means spreading your investments across different geographies, sectors, and asset classes. One popular approach is the 60-40 portfolio, which allocates 60% to stocks and 40% to bonds. You can build a simple 60-40, three-fund portfolio, using low-cost and diversified Vanguard index funds like Vanguard Global All Cap, Global Bond and Global Short-Term Bond Funds. However, a 60-40 portfolio might not be ideal for everyone, especially younger investors who can afford to take on more risk. As you get older and closer to retirement, you might shift more towards bonds for stability. When it comes to portfolio management, there are two main approaches, strategic and tactical. Strategic allocation is a long-term approach that involves setting your asset allocation and sticking to it, with periodic rebalancing. You would adjust your portfolio over time as you age, but only in response to changes in your investment goals. Tactical allocation, on the other hand, involves making short-term adjustments to your asset allocation, based on anticipated market and economic conditions. The issue is that accurately predicting short-term market movements is incredibly difficult. Even the most experienced professionals, such as active fund managers, struggle to do it consistently. Not surprisingly, financial experts, such as Vanguard and Morningstar, generally recommend a strategic allocation. Rebalancing is crucial for several reasons. First, it helps reduce risk, specifically concentration risk. By rebalancing your portfolio, you're selling assets that have become overweight and buying assets that have become underweight. This, in turn, realigns your portfolio with your strategic goals. Second, by reducing concentration risk especially in stocks, rebalancing reduces portfolio volatility, since stocks have historically outperformed bonds over the long term. For example, if your equities have outperformed, rebalancing means selling some stocks and buying bonds, resulting in lower portfolio volatility. Third, beyond risks and volatility, Rebalancing in down markets results in opportunistically buying equities at lower prices, when bonds often outperform equities. These factors together translate to higher risk-adjusted performance for your portfolio, measured by metrics like the Sharp or Sortino ratio. So, what are some caveats with rebalancing? First, while rebalancing can lead to higher risk-adjusted returns, it's important to note that rebalancing is not about maximizing absolute returns. In fact, it often underperforms a simple buy and hold strategy. The reason is simple. Over the long term, stocks have outperformed bonds, so continuously selling equities when they outperform means you're capping your potential returns. As Michael Kitz has noted in an article on rebalancing, the process of rebalancing to prevent equity exposure from drifting higher also curtails the favorable returns that come with allowing equities to compound. It's a trade-off, lower risk for potentially lower returns. However, there are some periods when rebalancing can result in better absolute returns, typically after down markets, as Vanguard and T. Rowe Price showed for the 10-year period between 2005 and 2015. Second, when rebalancing, it's important to be mindful of transaction fees and taxes. Many investment platforms don't charge transaction fees, but this varies so it's always good to check. This may affect the frequency of rebalancing, which we'll discuss shortly. 
taxes can be more complicated. Using tax-sheltered accounts like ICES or pensions can help shield your portfolio gains from capital gains tax. Third, if you rebalance too frequently, say monthly or quarterly, this can have an impact on returns. This is further compounded when using non-tax sheltered accounts, such as general investment accounts. For these accounts, you might want to use capital losses to offset your capital gains, and also consider using new contributions to rebalance your portfolio instead. Additionally, employing strategies like BED and ISA can help manage your tax liabilities. This involves moving assets from your general investment account into a stocks and shares ISA, up to the annual ISA allowance of £20,000. Repeating this process annually can help you maximize your ISA allowance and minimize capital gains tax to ensure your investments are as tax efficient as possible and as early as possible. So, when should you rebalance? There are two parts to this. First, it depends on whether you're in the accumulation phase when saving for retirement or the decumulation phase when you are spending in retirement. During the accumulation phase, when you're actively contributing to your portfolio, some experts recommend opportunistic rebalancing, which involves rebalancing only in down markets to buy equities at discounted prices. In rising markets, you could let your equity allocation ride unless you're particularly risk averse. However, when you are nearing retirement or are already retired, rebalancing regularly is much more critical. You can no longer afford big portfolio swings when you're relying on your investments for income. This brings us nicely to the second part of when to rebalance. Rebalancing strategies, of which there are broadly four categories, help us determine the events that trigger rebalancing opportunities. These define the trigger points and method of rebalancing. Calendar rebalancing is triggered at regular intervals, such as annually, semi-annually or quarterly. Threshold rebalancing kicks in when your asset allocations deviate from their target by a predetermined threshold, such as 5% or 20%. This can be done using absolute thresholds or relative thresholds. I personally prefer relative thresholds, as it tailors the thresholds to the size of each asset allocation. For example, applying a 20% relative threshold to an asset that comprises 50% of your portfolio gives us 60% and 40% for the high and low thresholds respectively. Rebalancing is triggered when these thresholds are breached. A hybrid strategy combines calendar and threshold rebalancing, where you rebalance at least once a year and additionally whenever thresholds are breached. Finally, contribution and withdrawal-based rebalancing involves using new contributions to a portfolio during the accumulation phase or withdrawals from a portfolio during retirement to facilitate rebalancing. However, this method may not be sufficient on its own, so you will likely need to augment this with one of the other strategies to maintain your target portfolio. Now, how do you actually rebalance? There are three options. First, do nothing. That's right, you don't need to do anything. But this only applies if you use balanced funds or fund of funds like Vanguard Life Strategy, Legal and General Multi-Index or HSBC Global Strategy Funds. They rebalance automatically, some on a daily basis. Just watch out for home country bias in some funds like the Vanguard Life Strategy Funds and keep an eye on fees. There is one specific variant I'd suggest to avoid in this category, target date funds. These can be too conservative too early by reducing the equity allocation too quickly and too early. Plus, you lose control over the portfolio allocation changes over time. That's two strikes. For these reasons, target date funds are generally a poor choice. Second, use robo-advisors and investing platforms that support automatic rebalancing, such as InvestEngine or Trading212. Some of these also support one-click rebalancing which enables you to trigger rebalancing on an ad hoc basis. Backtesting in Portfolio Visualizer found that rebalancing too frequently can hurt performance. Unfortunately, some established platforms such as Fidelity don't offer this feature, which leaves you with the third and final option. You have to manually rebalance your portfolio yourself. This will require you to calculate the necessary trades and manually buy and sell funds to rebalance your portfolio. This approach is best suited for simpler portfolios with a small number of funds, for example, a three fund portfolio with some satellite funds. Let's take a look at a few scenarios using Google Sheets to understand the practical steps involved in manual rebalancing. You will find a link to this in the description for those interested. 
In scenario 1, there is no rebalancing required. Here, your portfolio is within your thresholds, so you don't need to do anything. But let's briefly walk through the spreadsheet. You will see 5 assets, 2 equities, 2 bonds and 1 cash. The target reference allocation is 70% Vanguard Global All Cap Index Fund, 10% Legal and General Global Technology Index Fund, and so on. This represents the strategic portfolio at a given point in time. The high and low thresholds are derived from the target allocations, in this instance, 20% above and 20% below. These three columns will never change, hence the strategic nature of the allocation and the derived thresholds. I've decided to use 20% but you can tweak this. Next, the target value is derived from the actual portfolio value. For example, 70% of this value gives us the target value for Vanguard Global All Cap, which is £792,750. In the second section, we have the actual valuation and allocation, which reflects the current state of our portfolio. The delta to target valuation is used to calculate the portfolio adjustment. This brings us to the third section, which tells us if any of the thresholds were breached, and if so, how much to rebalance for each asset. In this instance, none of the assets breach their thresholds, so there is no need to rebalance. I have added a summary table below, which gives an overview of our strategic portfolio allocation by asset class. In scenario 2, we saw a bad year for tech stocks, and drew income primarily from our cash bucket. As you might expect, you will likely have to sell some of your bonds to maintain your target allocation. You will also need to replenish your cash bucket. So let's focus on these two assets on the spreadsheet. We see the global tech fund has dropped to 6.1% of the total portfolio, which is below the 8% low threshold. Likewise, cash comprises only 0.7% of the total portfolio, which is way below the 4% low threshold. However, something else to note, it's been a good year for global bonds and at 10.2%, it has exceeded the high threshold of 9%. The rule column tells us that these three assets have breached their respective thresholds and triggers rebalancing. The adjustments result in inflows to global tech and cash, and outflows from the other assets. This results in a final valuation that matches the target valuation in the strategic portfolio. Finally, Scenario 3 sees a strong year for tech stocks, which now comprises 14.3% of the portfolio, exceeding the high threshold of 12%. Global equities haven't done too badly too. Unsurprisingly, the outperformance of tech stocks has resulted in both bond funds dropping below their low thresholds. Rebalancing results in selling outperforming tech stocks and some global equities to buy primarily bonds, preventing the portfolio allocation from being skewed. Again, the final valuation for each asset aligns with the target valuation, as expected. Let's wrap up for today. Rebalancing isn't about absolute returns. In fact, it will likely result in lower absolute returns compared to a buy and hold strategy. Instead, rebalancing focuses on improving risk-adjusted returns by minimizing concentration risk and portfolio volatility. There is also an opportunistic element in down markets, where rebalancing allows you to buy equities at depressed prices. In their independent analyses conducted years apart, Michael Kitzes and Javier Estrada both found that portfolio rebalancing was the secret source, that significantly enhanced returns in retirement, when using the three-bucket strategy. I'll provide links to their articles, as well as to the simplified bucket strategy I discuss in another video. This straightforward six-year, two-bucket strategy is designed to offer peace of mind without the unnecessary complexity of the three-bucket strategy. If you are still here, thank you for your time, and I hope you found this helpful. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more content. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.